The first speaker of the session is Doreen Fraser. She's a professor of the University of Waterloo. She's also an affiliate member at Perimeter Institute and a member of Rotmar Institute of Philosophy. She's gonna talk about how to make measurement possible in QFT. Um, Doreen, you're gonna have 25 minutes for the talk and then um, I will give you a five minutes warning. Okay. And after the talk, uh, we will allow questions for five minutes. Okay. And so whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. And thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to talk about uh, this work. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today is part of a project that's the product of a very fruitful collaboration that I've had over the past several years with Maria Papagiorgio, who is a PhD candidate here at the University of Waterloo and also is uh, doing her PhD across with the University of Patras in Greece. Um, so uh, it's been uh, great working with her and I want to stress that uh, I'll, that this project would not have come to this stage without um, her being uh, such a great collaborator. Um, and uh, this is a project where we're very, very close to having the uh, paper finished for uh, for this. So you should be looking uh, for that to uh, pop up on the archive soon. Okay, so the title of this talk is, of course, an allusion to Raphael Sorkin's uh, influential work from way back in 1993 that we've heard about already at this uh, meeting. And the focus is going to be on um, thinking about the interpretive conclusions that come out of attempts to respond to uh, Sorkin's problem by tr trying to come up with a measurement theory for QFT that doesn't lead to, uh, to signaling, doesn't lead to his impossible measurement scenarios. Uh, so first of all, uh, we have also seen this week, I think, that there's a number of different ways in which contemporary projects in philosophy of quantum theory intersect with issues in RQI. So I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about what my motivations are for being interested in this particular project, although I have lots of other interests in philosophy of quantum theory and philosophy of physics more generally um, that intersect with other aspects of the work that's been going on this week. But for today's project, my motivations come from the work that I've done in the philosophy of QFT. So one of the conceptual questions which interests philosophers and people in RQI is, are the principles of quantum theory consistent with the physical principles of special relativity? So even back up past uh, and, and consider special relativity by itself before you even get to general relativity. Um, and if you're not a skeptic, then the deeper question is really how are the principles of these two theories made consistent? So uh, from my point of view, if this is the question you're interested in, then it would make sense to try to answer the question by examining quantum field theory, which is our relativistic quantum theory, rather than trying to interpret non-relativistic quantum mechanics and then afterwards ask yourself the question, of whether your interpretation of non-relativistic quantum mechanics is consistent with uh, relativity or not. Um, and then if you're really interested in questions about consistency, then in my view, it makes sense to examine um, more carefully axiomatic approaches to quantum field theory rather than textbook formulations of the theory um, due to the fact that they're intentionally set up in a way which is intended to at least be mathematically consistent at the beginning. Um, but of course, as we've already seen at this meeting, considerations of practicality have historically pulled back in the other direction if you want to uh, consider, for example, realistic examples of detectors. Okay, so then this gets to the question, but then what about measurement, which was part of our the original inspiration really for being worried about whether special relativity is consistent with quantum theory. And here I have the measurement problem in the background, some motivation here, but this talk is not going to be about the measurement problem. So leave that in the background. So then you might naturally ask, what about a local measurement theory for algebraic QFT, which would seem to bring us closer to answering this kind of question that we started out with? Um, so here there, I think, is an interesting uh, 
um, confluence between the philosophy literature and uh, the uh, literature on NQFT recently. Um, so uh, uh, John Ehrman and Giovanni Valente are two philosophers who wrote a paper about relativistic causality in AQFT. And they called back in 2014, before the recent work was done, uh, the lack of a local measurement theory for algebraic QFT a major scandal in the foundations of physics. And so in their paper, uh, correcting this, uh, uh, this gap, um, Fuster and Ver uh say that th this is a gap that has surprisingly lain open for a long time before they wrote this paper in which it gets addressed. Okay, so the starting point that Maria and I had for thinking about this is um, uh, Raphael Sorkin's uh, impossible measurement scenarios. So uh, we uh, have thought about Sorkin's uh, original work, and then there's been some very nice, uh, more recent work that has extended and made more precise some of the uh, some of Sorkin's results, and given much more many more examples uh, of uh, the impossible measurement scenarios. So uh, basically, the idea which I'm sure most people are familiar with, is uh, you have uh, superluminal signaling being made possible by uh, in, when you have this sort of uh, space-time setup. If, if you have in region 01 a uh, system that you give a unitary kick, uh, then since the, if you have another measurement that you're doing another system in, in region 03, you would expect that the expectation values of measurement outcomes for that system would not be affected by any non-selective measurement or unitary kick you do in region 01 because the two regions are, uh, are space-like separated. This uh, expectation is defied when you have this O2 intervening region between 01 and 03. And what Sorkin shows is there are cases in which um, you can do a non-selective measurement in O2, which then can uh, change the results of what you, what you get in, uh, in region O3. Okay, so it's useful, we think, to think about this impossible measurement result explicitly as a no-go result. Um, so, of course, no-go results have been really uh, very instrumental in uh, lots of progress that's been made in foundations of quantum theory. So uh, it's easy to read Sorkin's uh, impossible measurement scenario as a no-go result. Um, for philosophers, a no-go result, just a reductio argument, which means that you have an argument which looks like it's a really, uh, which, which looks like it's a certainly valid, looks like it's also a sound argument, but you get to the conclusion and you find that your conclusion is unacceptable. So in this case, the conclusion of the argument is that there are these bounded space like separated regions for which the expectation values of a measurement that you can find to the one region to region 03 depends on which non-selective measurement you perform in 01, which is uh, entails superluminal signaling if you're allowed to do a bunch of different measurements. And uh, so that's something that we need to reject if we're doing relativistic quantum theory. Okay, so uh, then we need to carefully scrutinize these premises. Um, lots of them are uh, fairly standard. Um, what Sorkin tried to do in setting up his scenario was to take measurement theory as we find it in quantum mechanics and do a sort of minimal extension of it to uh, the, the context of relativistic quantum theory. So he wasn't considering full quantum field theory with all of the assumptions and physical principles you would have in quantum field theory, so trying to do a more minimal kind of, uh, more minimal extension of measurement theory. Okay, so there's gonna be some key suspects here, uh, one of which is going to be Luter's rule for non-selective measurement. Um, the way relative, one of the ways relativity comes in here is going to be you're gonna to need to add on top of this non-relativistic measuring scheme, uh, some relativistic temporal ordering, which you're just gonna, it's gonna be a partial temporal order that you're gonna get just from Minkowski space-time or your uh, globally hyperbolic space-time of some sort. And then you're going to assume a local commutativity, microcausality uh, between your regions, but that's really all you're going to assume from quantum field theory. Okay, 
So one sort of main takeaway from this no-go result is something that was known already, but it, Sorkin's result really puts a uh, sharper point on it and provides a clear illustration, is that local commutativity plus imposing, the, or micro, which is also known as microcausality, plus imposing partial temporal order on the events is not going to be sufficient to rule out superlimal signaling in relativistic quantum theories. So in order to address this no-go result, because we want to exclude superlimal signaling, then you have to do what you always have to do when you're faced with a no-go result. And so you can have to reject at least one of the premises, or you could also add additional premises that are going to uh, block the conclusion. So this, that's particularly relevant in this uh, case, because as I said, um, there's a minimal physical setup for uh, relativistic quantum theory. There's lots more physical principles you can add that people think are important for uh, properly formulating QFT. Okay, so the flip side of this is you can also see quite clearly what's not relevant to solving the problem, because there are all sorts of conceptual issues that quantum field theory raises, and it's nice to be able to separate some of the ones that are not directly relevant from the ones that are, are relevant to Sorkin's particular problem. Um, of course, eventually we're gonna to wanna to solve these other issues too, but it's nice to be able to have a nice clear cut problem where you have only some issues being implicated. Okay, so in particular, it, merely making Luter's state update rule Lorentz covariant is not gonna be sufficient to solve the problem. Uh, there are all sorts of issues related to state dependent features of QFT, um, so the reach leader property, uh, reach leader theorem, uh, that's, there's no assumptions made about what state uh, you, these systems are, uh, are in, so that's not relevant. Um, also issues to do with type three von Neumann algebras, which are not directly relevant to the setup of the problem, which applies to either case. You can assume you have type one von Neumann algebras uh, or uh, you can assume that they're type three. Okay, so what I want to focus on is what is two approaches to responding to the no-go uh, result that uh, respond in a particular way. And the response involves introducing a new measurement theory for quantum for field theory systems that doesn't make all the assumptions that are made in Sorkin setup. Um, so I'm going to consider two approaches which have been represented already at this meeting, um, which is good for me because it would have been really hard to get through this talk if that wasn't the case. Um, but I want to flag that there, this is not the only way you can respond to Sorkin's results. So there's been lots of valuable work done with a different kind of approach. And so the, the, the nice paper I mentioned earlier by Borston and collaborators is an example of this where you don't consider measurement theory at all. So you don't consider uh, how to model a probe that's interacting with your quantum field. You just consider your quantum field theory and what kinds of restrictions you might place on the observables of that theory, for example, to make sure you're ruling out superluminal signaling. Okay, so the two approaches are the detector model approach and the uh, Fuster and Verick framework for AQFT. Um, so the detector model approach is um, probably something that's uh, been used in most of the talks at this meeting already. Um, I'm going to talk specifically about um, a detector-based measurement theory that's recently been proposed for the detector model approach. <clears throat> but essentially, the detector model approach is an approach in which you start with a particular model of a detector. And uh, so, for example, the Unruh DeWitt detector, and then you build up your measurement theory from that. Um, so this is a uh, tends to be a very pragmatic approach because you're connecting immediately at the beginning with um, the sorts of detectors that, uh, that that are realistic or and in theory or experiment or whatever. Okay, the other approach I want to consider is the one we just heard about in Chris's talk before the break, and that's the FB framework for AQFT. Um, so I've characterized this as having the main contrast that it's a more principled approach because the idea is you start off from a very general abstract perspective and you lay out axioms for uh, quantum field theory in the axiomatic framework. And then as we saw in Chris's talk, 
the idea is that you do get to models eventually, but that's not where you start. You start with these principles. And so then the project is initially to, um, to, to uh, infer what the consequences of the principles are. Okay, so in very uh, brief uh, terms, um, there are different goals these two approaches have, and there's different um, uh, there's different strategies they employ to try to achieve those goals, which are important to recognize. But I want to focus more for this talk on the interesting similarities between these two approaches, because it seems like the differences have gotten a lot of play in the debate uh, about these two approaches so far. Okay, so briefly, detector model approach. Uh, respond to the Sorkin type problem by retaining non-relativistic quantum mechanics and Luter's rule for the detector, which is some concretely specified model, and then use QFT just to model the field system. Then you can derive the state update rules for your QFT system. Um, and you use the detector models and regimes in which the calculations you do with your models show that for all practical purposes, there's no superluminal signaling. Now, there will be superluminal signaling because you've coupled this non-relativistic quantum mechanical detector model to your quantum field theory system. So it's not, the whole thing is not fully relativistic. But the point here is if you're, be, if you're trying to be practical, for all practical purposes, there are going to be regimes that you care about that you can use these models in without having to worry about Sorkin type impossible measurement scenarios happening. You don't have to worry about superluminal signaling. Principled approach, on, on the contrary, rules out superluminal signaling in principle. So it gets ruled out in general and it never happens because the whole thing is done fully within uh, QFT. So uh, as Chris explained in his talk, you use AQFT to describe both the probe and the system. Um, you don't bring Luter's rule in the beginning at all, um, and you derive new state update rules um, in the way he explained in his talk. And um, it's gonna turn out to be crucial if you ask why Sorkin type scenarios can't arise in this framework. The additional principles that you impose when you assume that all the axioms for AQFT hold are gonna block the superluminal signaling from happening. So in particular, the time slice uh, property, if you're familiar with that. It's a dynamical axiom, so you need to bring in this dynamical assumption really in order to rule out superluminal signaling. Okay, so moving on to the similarities, which I think are the, the interpretationally, interpretively interesting part of, uh, of this work. So one interesting similarity is that uh, both of these approaches involve modifications to a uh, sort of straightforward operational interpretation of local observables. And so maybe this is not surprising because they both involve considering what happens when you couple detectors or probes to your original qu quantum fields. So then that just makes your representation of observables much more complex and rich. But I think it's worth, for interpretive purposes, flagging this as something that's interesting and new. So. Within AQFT, there's a traditional operational interpretation of local algebras. So for example, this is from Hogg, um, that uh, your observables represent physical operations performable within the region over which you have your algebra. Um, there's also an, inter an operational interpretation informally of smeared operators in, in QFT, where you can think of the smearing function as representing uh, uh, the, the field um, with a smearing function representing a physical operation that's performable in the support of the region of the uh, smearing function. Okay, so in both the, these approaches, the localization regions are not going to match up this nicely with the, the operations. So in the FP framework, um, you're going to have uh, the consequence uh, that uh, an algebra of observables can be localized in any region in the domain of dependence of O. So there's gonna be nothing special really about O. Um, and this is gonna be a, a property of uh, the time slice property axiom, which is coming up again, important. Um, and in the detector models framework, uh, you're going to, um, 
uh, once you get into thinking about the role that the different elements of your detector models play in the representation, if you're being fully pragmatic, the, the role of the smearing function is, is just to give you a nice representation of your detector. There's no reason to choose a, a smearing function that has uh, support in the detector field interaction region, as long as it's not affecting the predictions that you get out of your model. Um, so there's no reason to, to impose that constraint on the way you set up your detector model in the first place. Um, but furthermore, there's interesting uh, considerations that come in when you consider covariant Hamiltonians. And then uh, it seems natural to interpret the smearing function as a holistic property somehow of the detector field system rather than, than just being uh, a uh, reflection of where the detector and the field interact. Okay, second similarity is that both the, the proponents of both these approaches make it clear that the new state update rules that get derived or uh, posited at least for the uh, relativistic systems fields cannot be interpreted as representing physical changes of state. Okay, so um, this is a similarity between the conclusions that these two approaches draw, but as I'm going to explain, the arguments for them are actually really quite different. But it, I think it's interesting that from different starting points, five minutes, okay, um, from these different parts, from these different goals and strategies and starting points, you get similar conclusions coming out. Okay, so so in the FV framework, there seems to be no reason to invoke a physical process of state reduction occurring at points or surfaces in space-time. So um, I think there's two reasons for this. One is the scattering theoretic picture, which uh, is behind the measurement theory that Chris was explaining in his talk. So very briefly, the, the in and out states are algebraic states, which I think it's best to think about as being counterfactual states, uh, possible states the system could, could have, but doesn't actually have at any point in its time evolution. Um, and so then you don't have a transition from a before state to an after state. You have a possible state and a, another possible state. Um, but beyond that, uh, the point that uh, is made in the paper by Fuster and Birch is there's a uh, there's a theorem proven that even when you're considering selective state update, um, you can either model selective a sequence of selective state updates as being se selective successive selective measurements in two regions, or you can model them by a single selective uh, measurement in a bigger region. Okay, so this suggests that there's no there's no real like boundary over space time between which measurement one when, after when measurement one is completed and measurement two has yet to be uh, conducted, even for selective measurements. So the way things look in the uh, Polo Gomez, Gray, Martin Martinez detector based measurement theory is again, you have the state update rules are such that they can't represent a physical change of state that happens in any space-time region. But this, in this case, this is tied to the way in which uh, the measurements are modeled. So what happens is you have, uh, first you have your detector and your field interacting in some region, pretend for a moment that the interaction is locally compact, then there's going to be some region in the causal future in which um, you're going to measure the uh, detector using a, a projective measurement like you would in ordinary quantum mechanics. And then you can infer from that measurement what the updated state of your field would be. But the key point here is that when you're updating your uh, endpoint functions, uh, you can derive a nice state update rule, which is just a state update rule for your, your fields and these endpoint functions. But uh, what state update rule you apply is going to depend on where the points in the endpoint functions are. So um, if they're in the causal, if all of them are in the causal future of your detector measurement region, 
the region in which you have uh, measured your detector and then applied your uh, projective measurement uh, to the detector, then um, you're going to use the selective state update rule for the field, but otherwise you're not going to. So uh, a consequence of this is that um, it doesn't really make sense in this framework to think of state update as something that happens in any region of space-time either. Okay, so uh, so quickly, um, that was a negative conclusion, and I think the really interesting part of this, the implications for this work are going to be in future work that needs to be done on thinking about what positive interpretations of quantum field theory are compatible with each of these two um, measurement theories. Um, so this actually relates to Faye's question after the last talk. I think that um, I, the measurement problem for uh, ordinary quantum mechanics, if we think about where that came from, um, it came from trying to fit a uh, the physical theory of non-relativistic quantum mechanics, including Schrodinger evolution, together with a measurement theory for non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Um, I think conceptually what's happening here is, of course, when you shift to uh, quantum field theory, you're going to have a new physical theory for quantum field theory, uh, relativistic quantum theory. But then you're also going to have to pair a new measurement theory with relativistic quantum field theory. And then the measure, then whatever the measurement problem is, whatever form it takes, or whether there's even any problem at all, is going to depend on the way these two things fit together in uh, quantum field theory. So thank you. That is uh, the conclusion. That's the future research direction. Thank you. Um, thank you, Doreen, for the nice talk. Um, I'd like to open for questions. We have five minutes for questions. Does anyone have a question? I see uh, Chris, uh, Chris, I mean, uh, Chris, go ahead, open your microphone. Thank you. Uh, just a small problem. I was sitting outside and suddenly there was a drip from a, rain, a drain pipe landed on me. Right. Um, thank you very much. It was a very interesting talk indeed. Um, could you go back a slide to your, um, here we are, yes. So it's really a comment in some ways that um, you say that in non-relativistic theory, uh, you have a quantum measurement theory and you, you've mentioned Paul Bush there at, at the bottom. Uh, and then you say, well, maybe there has to be something different uh, for relativistic quantum field theory. So it's really just a comment that a lot of what Reiner and I did was to adapt uh, the and reinterpret the uh, the quantum measurement theory from Powell, who was one of my colleagues. In fact, I don't know whether you know, and um, uh, and then apply that in quantum field theory. It looks a bit different, but it actually is very very similar to what they actually did. So I, I'm not sure I, you necessarily need a different thing. You just need the same thing, but in a in a broader framework. I okay, that's interesting. So yeah, so. Um... Uh, so by different, I mean the state update rules at least are going to be different, right? And so I think that because they take a different, well, uh, so you, you, you've paralleled the same steps, yeah. right? But clearly you need to have different formal state update rules. And then the question well, is how those get interpreted physically because they're mm -hmm. they're compatible with. Well, take, take a look at what Powell and his um, collaborators say in their book about uh, instruments. Uh, and indeed, we, we based the way we derived the state update rules very closely on, on the description of instruments there, which, which in fact uh, comes from um, Davies and uh, somebody else whose name escapes me just at the moment. Um, but, uh, so, so it has a, quite a long uh, prehistory. But, but actually, I think that the state update rules are effectively the same. It's just when you apply it in relativistic quantum field theory, you actually get, you are able for the first time to have a, a causal background as well, the, the, the uh, causal background of space time, which allows you to make question, uh, address questions about, um, you know, uh, measurements of space like separation and things like that. Right. But, but for under the hood, it's very much the same. Davis and Lewis, I should have said, by the way, it's, it's very much the same sort of thing. But, but okay. thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. I'd be interested in following up with you more about, mm. about that. I, so I think 
there's a question here about like whether um, you think of them as being like formally in the same category or whether they're um, going to be uh, like how different they really are, but which I think sure. is really interesting. Well, we could discuss that sometime. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I guess we can still, we still have time for one more question. Francisco, go ahead. Hi, Lauren. Thank you very much for, for the very interesting talk. Uh, so it seems that uh, you are saying that um, interpretations that don't favor a realist view of the quantum state. Ah, as... so I didn't say that actually. Um, yes. And that's what I avoided saying. So um, yes. I, I said something negative, right? Which was uh -huh. that the state at the deep rules cannot be interpreted as representing physical changes of state. Um, so in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, there's a debate, as you know, between um, whether you're going to have a you have a physical interpretation, ontic interpretation of the state, or whether you have an epistemic interpretation. And those are two compatible interpretations, and there's a lot of debate about which is the right one, right? I think the situation is different once you turn to these measurement theories for QFT, because in both of them, you don't have a debate with two sides. You have what would naturally be the physical interpretation of the state update in uh, from non-relativistic quantum mechanics not being an option. But then I haven't specified what the positive option is on the other side. And that's where I think, um, so yes, you could go fully, like if fully epistemic means cubism or something like that, then you could go that far here. But there's a big question I think about what the range of compatible interpretations is. And, um, so, and I think that's an interesting question that people should be thinking about and working on. Thank you. It's a very interesting question indeed. Yeah, thanks. So let's thank Doreen. Thanks. And uh, I was uh, wondering what, well, um, what role or what do you think in, uh, about the extent to which in the case of the, the formalizing which we have to use uh, quantum fields as probes, uh, it is an obstacle that uh, that it did not, I mean, the translation of um, the measurement process to uh, to uh, to producing actual definite values. Like um, because for me the, the the main the main problem that I see for for uh, for, for this formalism, I would I, I guess, is that I don't see exactly how we can translate the measurement process into actual experimental values because we still don't know how to measure a probe as long as the probe is uh, still a quantum field. So, so um, yeah, I would, I would like to, 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 to hear exactly what do you think about, about that obstacle. Okay, yeah. So um, one of the things I didn't talk about was um, about sort of differences in scopes of application of uh, your detector-based measurement approach versus the AQFT approach. And that was what Chris's talk was about earlier today as well. Um, so I think part of your question um, has to do with that gap, right? Between, um, there's a sort of practical question of um, what is the scope of applicability if you're thinking about um, the sorts of detector models that have specific properties um, the, the, the how far does the AQFT formalism go? And I take it that um, I think people have to stop publishing so many papers because I can't keep track of all the new developments. But the it, I think that the AQFT project the there's still a ways to go, and there's work to be done to construct the models for particular detectors, especially ones you might be interested in as realistic. Um, to detectors if you have um, particular uses in mind for them, right? Um, so that's part of your question has to do with that that practical side, right? Yeah, basically whether you think that that gap is actually a gap that exists or is it something that is you know, already... So, and so there's the, the way I just phrased it though, I hope um, that uh, there's a kind of, um, there's a, I think a way of viewing the detector-based approach as complementary to the AQFT approach. Right? Agree, so it's like whether you start I, from the top. I'm not trying, I'm not trying to antagonize them. I'm no, sorry. no, and, and I but I think that this is a genuine question, right? So so one way of setting it up and the way I was doing it was in my answer to your question was to say, okay, so there's different scopes of applicability and different uses for these two different models. So then you can view them as complementary rather than being rivals or in any kind of inconsistent tension. 
but I think that there is a, a another kind of question about where all this will end up, right? Which is the kind of in principle question about whether, you know, at the end of the day, is it going to be just that you can do everything in the general kind of AQFT way and you're going to find you're going to construct models for everything. Uh, it, you're going to might need to make some modifications, to the principles and like tweak things, but is, is that going to be the way it ends up? Or are you going to always need to have a detector based approach because for practical reasons, you're not going to be, you're going to have models that you want to construct using tools from quantum field theory and measurement theory, which are just not going to fall under the general axioms for AQFT or any kind of general axioms. Um, so I see that as being a kind of question which we probably can't answer right now. I don't yeah. know. I mean, in <laughs> principle questions, you can never really answer, right? Because people could always say, oh, you know, we just need to do a little bit more work and we'll figure out how to make these two things fit together. But I think that's the deeper question maybe you're asking is, it, and, like, and, and I think this is, you suggested, like, can we, is it, is it gonna be, is there a problem in principle with having quantum field theoretic probes that we can't, like, we can't measure them directly. So then you're gonna to need to have some detector. Is the detector gonna to have to be um, macroscopic? This came up in Harris's talk as well, right? With the idea of decoherence having to come in at some point. Um, yeah, so those are questions which I don't know that we're close to being able to give convincing answers to those types of questions. And I just have to, one thing is you're just gonna wait till we get further with this project because um, all of these, different proposals are fairly new. So working out some of the concrete applications is gonna take a while. Thank you very much. Thank you.